All right, I have 245 on my eye watch, so we'll get started. I'm Barbara Dahl. I work with North Carolina Sea Grant, and I'm also a faculty member in the Bio and Ag Engineering Department at NC State University. Our session today is estimating the opportunity, flood reduction, implementation cost, and potential economic and water quality benefits of natural infrastructure in the Middle Neuse River Basin. That's a mouthful. I wrote that why. Anyway, we have uh, we did a study that lasted about 16 months that was fun, funded by the NC Policy Collaboratory. We have four of the study participants, that's including myself today, to talk about different components of the work that we completed. Um, there's other parts we're not going to be able to cover because it was quite a lengthy study, but you can, if you want to know more, we can send you a summary report is available online or there's a big 300 and some pager. You can really dig down into the weeds on this. So I'm gonna start off first and um, talking more specifically about a lot of the modeling work. And I'm kind of overview some of the economic work, which you'll get some more detail a little bit on, on parts of that uh, later. I do wanna acknowledge that a lot of the modeling work I'm showing was as completed by Dr. Jack Kirky Fox, who'll present next, and Dan Line, also in the Bio and Ag Engineering Department. Well, we we typically have used a lot of gray infrastructure when dealing with flood mitigation, right? So one of the ways is we might have an obstruction on a waterway, a bridge, a carver that's causing backwater. So we need to upsize that, maybe raise the elevation of that to allow more flow to prevent backwater. Also, a big thing we did over many decades was dam up a lot of rivers to create reservoirs and ponds to store water, and some of those were very much in the name of flood mitigation. And luckily in North Carolina, we did not do a whole lot of blockading water, creating levees or flood walls, although we do have a few of those around the states. And so this is kind of that gray infrastructure because concrete's involved in that. It kind of comes from that color. But the those last two items really have been viewed as more not very environmentally favorable or higher risk, especially in the face of climate change, where we're seeing more severe, more frequent severe storms that put these things that are barricading or holding back large amounts of water. So the kind of tune has changed where people are considering this concept of natural infrastructure, more of a green infrastructure approach. Also, I hear we hear here it referred to as nature-based solutions, where we're looking at ecosystems to help provide this. So we want to look at mimicking natural processes and doing things that might also help biodiversity, not just putting concrete in the environment. And I really think this last bullet, these are some bullets that are kind of excerpt from different literature, but the last bullet really sells, says what we were looking at with our study is all alterations, restoration, or use of landscape features to reduce flood risk, erosion, and runoff. That's kind of the focus of our work. And at NC State in particular, we've had a long history working in uh, reforestation, wetland restoration, stream restoration. And we also looked at a new type of approach called water farming. And we're gonna talk um, pretty, a little more about that in detail from the landowner perspective. So for this project, our, our main question was, can natural infrastructure really mitigate flooding? And then what are some of the potential costs and benefits of that? Kind of focusing on in on some of the different environmental uh, benefits and not just damage reduction. Like the Army Corps, they really you know, look at, we're gonna pay this and this is the, the reduction in damage. So we wanna kind of expand beyond that with our work. Although I'd say we're not comprehensive in what we've done. So the first part of our process is that we identified, oh, let me go back, I skipped. So our approach for the study is that to model the whole middle noose was kind of a big lift. So instead we focused on three separate sub basins around the 55 to 77 square mile size where there was a USGS gauging station. And we decided we're gonna model these three sub watersheds in great detail and take what we learned from those and extrapolate that to the full Middle Noose Basin. 
So our approach was to first identify opportunity in these sub-basins. Where can I put this wetland stream restoration water farming? And then we did a lot of hydrology and hydraulic modeling to look at what kind of peak flow and water surface reductions we could have. We did water quality modeling, and then we extrap extrapolated results to the full middle noose basin for the modeling piece. So for looking at potential sites, we did kind of the typical overlay a lot of stuff in GIS soils, um, where wetlands formerly were, where's the different land uses, and then identified potential sites. And then we went out to these watersheds and looked at 241 locations and said, is that really good for what we identified through this kind of map overlay process? And we found that a lot of cases, some of the sites were not good, or it might have said wetland, but it would be better for water farming. So we went back and refined that analysis and then um, came up with the types of sites we need. Well, I've said this term water farming. What we're talking about is an engineered system that would have a uh, hold water for a period of time. And then once the peak flows downstream are reduced, you would release the kind of managed gate or outflow system and allow that water to come out. Well, that helps to dissipate the peak discharges then downstream by that uh, desynchronization of the flow. So it would requ require berm or terrace and outlet structures for that. What we found is this would be most appropriate on flatter slopes, less than 1.1%, because we were looking at minimizing the berm heights to about five feet. We didn't want to create high risk impoundment type structures. And we wanted fairly large areas, so we minimized um, anything less than 20 acres we did not want to include as an identified sites. And of course, we're looking at agricultural land. Well, to kind of get out how much water you can actually store on these sites, we did kind of mock designs for a number of locations that were identified. So we, in red, that shows the berming that would be done, that would be necessary to hold the water back. And then you see each of those black dots, that would be a water control structure where there's an existing ditch that would have to have that structure. This helped us with um, then putting in the DEM elevation information. We could look at volume of water that would sit on that farm. And it also helped us with costing because we could say the length and height of the berm, how many structures and this type of information. So this was very helpful. So with the three watersheds, Bear Creek, you can see in yellow, the water farming locations that we came up with. Here in Nahunta Swamp, there in yellow, you see all the water farming locations. And we did not find any in Little River or the other parts of the upper basin. And that's because of the steeper slopes. If we had steeper, tried to put it on steeper slopes, you can have a lot of berms very close together are very high berms. So that just was not a feasible alternative for these locations. So you can see um, about 5% in each of the others and about 1.1% when we extrapolated to the middle noose. Um, we also identified locations for flood storage wetlands. I'm not gonna talk about the design of those because Jack's gonna cover that in the next presentation. But then once we had our process for design and siting of those, you can see here's where we I, I identified sites in Bear Creek and red is the wetland and blue is the area draining to that wetland. Here's Nahunta Swamp. So we found about 21% um, of Bear Creek watershed could be controlled by wetlands and about 12% of Nahunta and only about one and a half percent of Little River and 5.7% of the Middle Noose. For reforestation, we fo focused on low productivity cropland with the index, uh, crop productivity index of less than 0.3. So this would not be about really storing a lot of water. It's more about reducing the amount of runoff from that area, a little bit different approach. So in Bear Creek, we had a lot of opportunity in the lower basin. They're shown hatched in green. Um, not much opportunity in Nahunta Swamp. There's just not much uh, low productivity cropland. There's a lot of high productivity. Little River, we had a good amount that we identified in the upper part of the basin. So this was something that was more viable than the wetland and water farming for the upper part of the basin because we just didn't have those opportunities 
and as high in the upper part of the basin. Oops. So if we look at the reforestation potential of all the sub-basins and the middle noose there, you can see we had about 8.4% of the, of the whole basin. Again, Nahunta is one of the lower ones. So that's kind of more distributed and not just because it's a lower or upper part of the basin. It's not so slope driven. So then we built detailed hydrology models and HEC HMS for all three of the sub-basins calibrated those models to various hurricane events, including Floyd for Bear Creek and Matthew for the other two. You can see observed in blue and our model in red, so very good agreement. We were able to get very good uh, calibration. And then we went about inserting those measures into the watershed. So there's different kind of some of it's inserting a reservoir into the model and other parts is kind of tricking it out by adding a curve, changing the curve number. So um, I'm not gonna, I don't have a lot of time to go in, into that, but I wanna get into some of the results of the, of the work. So for Nahunta Swamp, you can see we had very minimal, the red bar there, minimal reductions in peak discharge for a Hurricane Matthew event um, with, just because we did not have much reforestation, about 1.8%. So you see just a small percentage drop, whereas you see it come up to about around 8 9% when we start looking at the wetlands and, and water farming. And when we combine every, the wetlands and water farming together, we get about 13.6% reduction and peak discharge at the outlet of Nahunta, which would lower water level levels in a Matthew event by less than a half of a foot, about four tenths of a, four hundredths of a, of a foot, four tenths of a foot, excuse me. In Bear Creek, where we had a lot of potential for wetlands, you can see, I'm, I'm not gonna repeat all those numbers, but you can see the reductions increasing as we go and, and very high to over 20% reductions for both the water farming and wetland and then the combined of all three practices together. So we can get a significant or a substantial reduction in peak flow. And this equated to about a one foot drop in the water surface at the outlet of Bear Creek for a Hurricane Floyd scale event. So that was substantial. So then um, for the reforestation, that was pr pretty easy to extrapolate because you're just modifying curve numbers in the areas. But to extrapolate the peak flow reductions for um, the wetlands and water farming, we took those two subbasins, Nahunta and Bear, and varied the amount of the practice in that subbasin and looked at the peak flow reductions and developed these kind of regression re relationships to be able to say how much peak flow reduction you get in that other subbasin based on how much opportunity you have there. And so then this led to what peak flows we would have in all of the other, that extrapolation process. So you can see at the upper part of the basin, the peak flow reduction is very minimal, again, because we didn't have a lot of opportunity. There was some reforestation, but again, that doesn't store water, it does reduce runoff. So it doesn't have the same storage potential. And there you see the total of the different practices that throughout the middle noose. So reforestation, pretty high. And you can see at the bottom end of the middle noose, we have much higher reductions because that's where a lot of the water farming and wetlands are concentrated. And these have that much higher storage potential for water. So if we look down, the, we also looked at the peak flow at the communities along the Noose River, including Smithfield, Goldsboro, and Kenston. So it's Smithville, which is located in the upper part of that basin. Not much reduction because remember, there's just not much potential as we're in the upper part. As we get to Goldsboro, you can see we get to combining all the measures, we get to about a 4.4% reduction in peak flow. And at Kenston, 5.3%. Well, this would equate to only about three and four tenths of a foot reduction in the water surface. So we're not talking a great big, you know, drop in the water. And so why is that? So if we look at Kenston, we have the, the Noose River there. That's the, the main river. It also has a, a flood flow kind of channel off to the side. And, and that's where the two bridges are that are grayed out. And so when we're in a hurricane, this is actually showing around a 100 year event, the blue line, we're way out onto this floodplain with that water. 
So even if we had a one foot drop in that water elevation, we're still going to be out into the floodplain. And that's the nature of the system. That's how our rivers, our creeks, their natural formation in alluvial valleys are that we have a channel and we have a floodplain. So we're not going to eliminate flooding in the 100 year floodplain or even probably the 500 year if we get a 500 year event because that's the natural way that the water is going to be out there once we're in a 25 50 100 year storm we're out into the floodplain. So even though that seems like not much we did see some damage reductions from that. We looked at the Feynman tool, which gives you the at every half a foot where the water is inundating in these communities and what how many structures and the cost of those that are in, are being damaged. So using that information for Kinston and Goldsboro, we looked at the damages for the different return interval storms. And we found, you know, somewhere between seven and 21% reduction in the uh, a hurricane. Um, in, in these various storm level events with the greatest reductions in the 50 year storm. That's where it appeared to provide the most benefit more than that great big um, 100 or, or 500 year event. We also saw that peak flows, um, when we look at within those study watersheds were not uniform to the basin. So we saw a distribution of the peak flows. So it had something to do with the location in the watershed, that density of natural infrastructure and um, you know where that natural infrastructure is located. So it's not uniform, but in general, you see higher peak flows somewhere in the middle and upper reaches less than at, at the mouth. And that also correlates with what you see with the water surface elevation reductions. But we had pretty high in some areas, 49% reduction in peak flow. And in some areas, very high drops within that watershed in the water surface elevation showing that kind of benefit is it's greater at the smaller kind of catchment scale than it is when you're talking a whole river basin and on the Noose River. So um, for economic analysis, we did a lot of things. We're not going to cover all this today. Um, we did identify some leasing and purchase options and Tibor Vays here with us today is going to talk about that. We estimated direct cost. I talked a little bit about how we did that for water farming. We did something similar for wetlands. Um, we looked also at what investments would be needed to give to these landowners to get these things started. Um, some of that work is published by Meredith Hovis and others. Um, I'll send you that paper. We looked at different spending pathways. If um, when we do stream restoration or wetland restoration in the state, where does that money go? How much of it goes to, uh, you know, employ different people to operate equipment, you know, or uh, buy fuel or these types of things. So we did a lot of work with that. We did the structural flood damage, which I, I showed you a piece of that. And we also estimated water quality benefits, which Jack is going to cover. Um, we also, um, UNC Chapel Hill, Dr. Todd Bendor and some of his students looked at the economic impacts of those investments. So if I spend a dollar on a wetland restoration or a reforesting, where does that money go? What is the uh, economic impact of that? And this kind of summary slide, I'm going to go through some of this, where what this shows at the top, um, the Hold on, let me get my laser pointer here. The amount of each of the practices in acres, so uh, there, the portion of the water shed, so we're affecting about 10.5% of the middle noose. Well, to do all these things would cost $726 million. So you go, whoa, that's a lot of money. And a lot of that is in the wetland restoration because of the amount of earthwork for those. But they do store a lot more water per acre on the wetlands. In fact, three times water farming and nine to 20 times the reforestation. But this would result, uh, Dr. Bender's work showed this would result in 1,665 jobs created and that money in the economy pretty much being equal to the expenditure on that. 
791 million going directly into the economy. And then when they looked at these indirect multipliers, so in other words, yeah, that's directly going to that restoration industry, they saw that the multipliers were over two for this. So we would have much greater than that, the investment and more jobs. In fact, we end up with over 8,971 jobs created by that indirect effect. So in summary, I got one minute, I'm about to get booted off, even though I'm a moderator, is that NI does have the potential to reduce downstream flooding. The opportunities for most of the practices are best on lower slopes where we have less development. Peak flow reductions are you know, spatially variable, depending on that location and density of where you put it. Um, peak flows reductions are higher on the smaller tributaries than on the main river segments. Flood st storage wetlands do provide the greatest benefit over the other two practices. And the cost of implementation is substantial, but that money does come back in the terms of those kind of direct and indirect uh, multipliers. So I will, we do have a website, you can get information or you can email and follow up with me. And I'm gonna let you <laughs> change the slide. Right. And next up we have Tibor and he's gonna talk about some of the um, ways to get at leasing with landowners and what that would cost, what that program will look, maybe look like. I can't see it though. Um, well, And then that works um, forward and back right there. Well, thank you for having me at this conference. Uh, it's nice to see people. It's nice to not look at a screen after two years of looking at just your screen. So I'm just so thankful to be here and present to you. My name is Tibor Vague. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, I'm also a senior policy associate at Duke's Nicholas uh, Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions. And uh, I'm a Wolfpacker. I went to uh, the state for undergrad. So um, I'm affiliated with all, all three schools. Um, so this project, I put just my name on the first slide, but uh, from the previous two presenters, you saw that there were so many partners uh, affiliated with this work. I, it, it was just mind blowing. It's, it was really a cool project to be a part of and just so thankful to, to have been a part of it. Uh, I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of detail about, um, about the modeling and the natural infrastructure and defining all the terms. You've heard from the previous two presenters uh, what we mean by natural infrastructure. What I want to talk to you today about is can we get the land and for how much? Talking about wetland restoration, reforestation, and water farming. For, um, for wetland restoration, um, our NC State colleagues um, identified opportunity areas. And really, that's what we got from them. We got a couple numbers, try to find um, acreage on the land. And all the modeling was done by them. We really came into the picture right after the modeling was done. And we defined two research questions for our study. What are the most cost-effective leasing options to get land for reforestation and water farming? And what is the cost to purchase farmland for wetland restoration? So lease or purchase options. Um, so we had to figure out what the farmers in the study area think and what is their background and at what cost they would be willing to um, lease or sell land uh, for, uh, for natural infrastructure implementation. The way we framed this analysis to them was we used the payment for ecosystem services or more narrowly a payment for watershed services uh, program. That's how we define what we're doing. 
you would get paid if you allow your land to, for a part of your agricultural land to flood for certain periods of time, for a couple of weeks at a time, or you could also sell the land and then natural infrastructure uh, um, uh, would be implemented um, would be implemented on it. So the NC State team gave us two numbers, and our task was to try to find um, available land for it. We derived supply curves, um, so we can actually talk about getting more or less of this acreage and finding that in our study area. In the middle of the pandemic, collecting data, primary data from farmers was very difficult. The way we went about it is we did a Qualtrics, uh, an online Qualtrics survey, and we worked with partners to identify uh, 618 um, name email address combinations in the study area. And we were trying to understand our farmer population of almost 3000 farmers in the six county area. We developed with our partners and uh, experts um, in this region, a survey that uh, had 54 questions. It took about 20 minutes to, uh, to answer. And we asked farmers about their background, their experiences with flooding, um, and also asked them, they, we presented to them scenarios to better understand the cost and acreage that they would be willing to um, consider in a leasing or a purchase um, setup. We described like I said, a payment for watershed services or payment for ecosystem services type transaction to them. So even though this was a hypothetical uh, program that we presented to them, uh, our pre-testing showed that farmers in the area were familiar with this terminology and they really weren't just, you know, gonna give us answers that, that do not correspond to reality. We asked, for bids from our farmers. So for each scenario, we, de we developed 13 of them. Uh, we asked for a per acre bid in dollars and the acreage enrolled under each of these scenarios. And we received um, a full set of responses from 50 of the farmers. So a relatively small sample. Um, and th this sample corresponds to somewhere between five to 7% um, of, the air, of the acreage uh, that we were looking for. So basically in our sample, um, our sample represented uh, five to 7% of the study area in terms of acreage. To extrapolate uh, from the sample, we had to make two assumptions. One is that the farmers are representative of other farmers um, in the study area, and their land is also representative of, um, of agricultural land in the study area. So from the 618 um, contacts, um, only about 586 were valid. So this, these came from uh, county agriculture extension offices. Uh, the list included people that were just somewhat interested in agriculture to actually farmers who were decision makers on their farms. And uh, we ended up receiving about 85, uh, par at least partial responses with useful data and 50 uh, complete response sets. Um, after doing some adjustments on our response rates, we, um, we calculated 35% was our uh, response rate, with, with, which corresponds really well um, to other similar studies done uh, with farmers or uh, forest landowners in the study area. Our uh, sample is fairly representative of the population. Uh, so this is a breakdown of farmers in the six uh, county study area. I combined Lenore and Green because we got the uh, contact list um, combined for these two counties. So we are tracking pretty well both our contact location with both our contact locations or our um, our tracked locations the distribution 
of farmers uh, across our study area. A few results here. Um, most of the land, uh, the agricultural land is owned versus leased. So about 75% is owned. Um, our racial and ethnic um, breakdown corresponds very well to the population, although we did not pick up any Black or African American landowners in the study area. Um, the ownership is 90% um, male per our sample. And our, we know from uh, the USDA that, um, that at the population level, it's closer to about uh, three fourths, so 74%. Uh, the mean acreage uh, uh, that, that the farmers um, farm was 145 acres, although a couple really big tracts were also part of our sample. These were over 3,000 acres. Most of the land, most of these tracts that were part of our sample were outside of a 100-year floodplain, so that's what we were looking for. We wanted to make sure that we could bring in uh, from outside the floodplain, extra, if you will, land that could help mitigate flooding. Our farmers were uh, familiar with, um, with uh, other similar conservation programs. So we're not um, asking farmers something, you know, that they haven't ever heard of. Uh, CRP and uh, crop insurance were about 40 to 60% as far as um, participation rates. Um, we modeled most of our scenarios actually um, uh, based on the CRP. So that's, that was good news uh, to see in our sample. Um, those that are leasing, we had, we had about 25% that were leasing, uh, would not be able to participate in, um, in uh, water farming but those that own their land would obviously be able to um, if they wanted to. So we adjusted our, um, uh, our sample and our results based on this, uh, based on this fact. Um, we picked up mostly, I would say fairly um, uh, well-to-do uh, farmers by uh, household income. So that's also something to consider. Uh, they might have um, uh, land that they're willing to kind of uh, enroll in such a program with um, minimal or limited uh, financial impact on their household income. Um, so existing flood control structures, we asked them about uh, what they have on these tracks that they're providing answers or um, responses for. There's quite a bit, uh, ditches, canals, and, and tile drains uh, were, were the most prevalent, but there's an opportunity to increase um, uh, the rate of, of uptake of these uh, structures on, the, on their uh, parcels. Most of our farmers were familiar um, from personal experience uh, with past, past flooding. On average, about 30% of, uh, of their land, of their tracts were flooded in the worst flood event that they ever experienced. Um, and as a result, they, um, they experienced delayed harvest or decreased crop uh, yield. We asked them about this hypothetical uh, payment for ecosystem services program, and since it's hypothetical, they had concerns about most aspects of this uh, of such a program. But um, the highest ranking uh, concern was the payment amount, uh, program risks, uh, and limitations on um, future uses of the land that they would enroll in a program. Uh, a very interesting finding, though, is um, most of them would prefer that the state make them an offer as opposed to uh, bidding in, in, in such a program. So about almost 90% of them uh, wanted to um, receive an offer as opposed to make an offer. Um, I talked briefly uh, already about um, flooding impacts on their tracts. Um, uh, the damages that they predicted would occur uh, from, um, from a flooding event on, on their tracks were roughly on the, on the order of $850 on average. So um, that's also good to know um, in order to kind of put their bids in context, like what they're willing to bid and how many acres they're willing to enroll in, in the program. So with uh, 50 complete, uh, complete responses, we derived supply curves um, by first ordering responses, so or ordering um, uh, 
responses by the cost at which they enrolled them. And then also the acreage that they um, that the farmers were willing to enroll in the program. We calculated marginal costs um, uh, per acre for these uh, for these um, responses, and we derived um, these supply curves that you see on the on the x-axis is cumulative acres enrolled, and on the y-axis is total program cost. So each of the thirteen scenarios. Um, show uh, an upward slope. So um, it's, it's really truly a supply curve as you move out towards the right of, um, of the x-axis, the cost, the program costs obviously rise. The two vertical lines, that's really what we are looking at. We had to get um, about 560, somewhere between 560 to 750 acres uh, from our sample to provide to our colleagues who did the NI modeling. This is uh, the annual cost uh, per acre curve. It's interesting, and the reason why I'm showing it is because you can see we're very close to the origin um, on these supply curves. We are at the very low end of uh, annual cost per acre. You can get um, for, for less than $20 an acre of annual cost, we can get um, more than what we need on our study area to enroll in NI. This is our big summary table. Um, really, I just want you to focus on the orange lines. The least cost scenario is scenario one, the first row. Uh, the total upfront program costs were uh, 1.6 to 1.7, 1.8 million dollars. Uh, uh, at a per acre, per acre cost of five to six dollars an acre. The second best scenario were up, um, the 15 year scenario with upfront payments, very similar to uh, scenario one. And the five year scenario with upfront payments was the, was the third best option. For the purchase, that's the yellow on the bottom, uh, scenario 13. Um, the annualized per acre cost for this purchase scenario. So to acquire land for uh, wetland restoration, that would be about 910 to $933 um, from, from our sample. So what do these results mean? First, um, we did not consider forest and timberland owners in this supply curve. So there's a chance that uh, we could get more or even more land for less, but we focused on agricultural land uh, for the reasons uh, my colleagues have already discussed. So relative to the opportunities that they identified, we have more than enough farmers and more than uh, enough supply of land to enroll in the program at relatively low prices. So the prices that we saw were really not, not, that, uh, not that high. Now in the big picture of that, that you heard already, we have to build stuff, we have to uh, build the NI, also acquire the land, that's a different question, but for our piece, acquiring the land is really not that costly. The lowest cost lease contracts are similar in design to CRP easements, um, showing that perhaps the familiarity to CRP is, is a factor in why landowners responded with, um, that they were willing to enroll enough acres at a relatively low cost into the program. If we, when we included um, annual payments or crop loss damage um, compensation, the program cost would obviously go up by one to 2 million um, and even up to 10 million uh, over the, the, the program, but that would allow more risk averse uh, farmers to be included in the program. So that's something to consider. Um, the purchase prices that we identified in our survey are consistent with very low productivity uh, agriculture land. So um, what we are seeing, the, the price range is really at, at almost like an 80% discount to um, average 2020 crop, uh, cropland value in the study area. So it seems like to answer the question, we can get enough farmland for relatively low price. Thank you for your, uh, for your attention and I will take questions.
time for one question. Somebody wants to ask? No, it's getting late in the afternoon. <laughs> okay, last but certainly not least, we have Will McDowell with the Environmental Defense Fund. And for this project, we not only had the academics and the student researchers, we had a number of partners in the project that represented NGOs and um, farm industry. And so Will was one of those advisors and he really gave valuable information to the process. So um, he's gonna talk a little bit about kind of some of the funding that's coming down the line and what may happen with some of that and maybe some other programs out there we can look at. Start my time yet, Barbara. Thank y'all for having me here. I agree with Tibor. It's so nice to be in person. Well, I'm going to start off and let you know that my daughter is a high school senior and is heading off to college. And you're saying, why is he telling me this? Well, this presentation is a little bit been like raising a child. When Barbara first asked me, I had this idea among all those 300 pages of the study we did of what I wanted to talk about. But through the process of developing it, it's kind of taken a life of its own. We've had our fights. Um, I've, I've laughed a little bit, but not as much as I wanted to. And now I'm ready for it to leave home. So here we are, it's going into the world. What I'm hoping to talk with you today about is how do we take the science that's being produced, been presented here at this conference, being created by our agencies and our universities, our NGOs and our business partners, and make it actionable for local communities so they can develop projects like natural infrastructure that are gonna meet their flood reduction needs. So I'm gonna go in a little bit of a different direction here and really talk kind of a policy piece and kind of science infused into that. I'm gonna start actually and tell you kind of a little Goldilocks story, right? We all know the story of the three bears and they find something that's too big and too small, they're looking for just right. Well, Barbara and Jack have talked about kind of what's that size. I'm gonna go back to that and, let, and say, you know, too often we think of flooding in a localized area, right? A, a cherished building, business district, a farm, something in a town limit is being flooded. Well, this boundary thinking, this thinking inside of our boundaries too often doesn't work. We're either not thinking about the upstream solutions that could help us in that place, and so we don't solve the problem. Maybe we solve the problem in that place, but it creates more problems downstream. And so I just want to kind of put it out there, boundary thinking is too small. The flip side, river basins, right? We've got these big river basins. We want to try to develop solutions maybe that solve the problem for the noose. Well, this doesn't work for several reasons. First, it doesn't allow local solutions to emerge, right? What's gonna work in the lower basin at Newburn is different than what we need in Goldsboro, is different than in my hometown in Durham. Secondly, basin scale solutions are often too big, right? Think of reservoirs, big levee systems like they have in the Mississippi basin. These don't fit today's needs. They're environmentally damaging. They require eminent domain to take away private property. And they can take years, decades to build because of the planning, designing, permitting. So river basin thinking is too big. As you know where I'm going here, watersheds are the just right solution, right? It's at this scale that the people in the watershed have a shared sense of the problems, they can have the conversations and they can develop local solutions. And we're hopeful that those local solutions will be the natural infrastructure that can work with private landowners that can be put into priority locations at the scale of the watershed 
to begin to affect hydrology and begin to solve our flooding solutions. So watersheds are the scale where the opportunity meets the problem. With this, I wanna jump into kind of a policy framework that we've been thinking about at EDF and our colleagues um, who think about these issues at a state level and put forward kind of a resilience policy framework um, that again, will help to bring the science through the state government down to local solutions. So the first piece goes back to this watershed approaches. These are processes where local communities, local decision makers can set goals, can determine what their priority projects are gonna be, and can create standardized planning processes to begin to make that happen. The second piece are decision support tools. Right? How do we take the models and the science to create a tool that's usable by local governments to select projects that maximize their benefits? The third really is focusing around state coordination. How do we organize state government so that it's all agencies are pushing in the same direction, are trying to achieve the same outcomes? And then finally, the funding and financing, right? The mechanisms that will get this money that's coming into the state from the federal infrastructure bill, that's being appropriated by our state legislature and get it out the door effectively. I'm gonna spend a few minutes going through each of these in a little more detail, try to give you a sense of what's happening here in North Carolina and a couple of lessons that we've been learning from other states that may be useful um, here in the state. So first, watershed approaches. I put this picture up of uh, a group of us that went out to Iowa. Um, Barbara, I know you're in there somewhere, um, a few others. It was, a, it was a great trip and a chance for us to go out and learn how they've been using what they call the Iowa watershed approach, which is driven by, uh, again, science that's been created at the University of Iowa and the Iowa Flood Center to inform those processes. They've hired coordinators in their watersheds to help manage the conversations. And they've been securing federal funds to implement the projects that are being created um, or being proposed by those, um, by those watershed approaches. Similarly, Louisiana has what's called the Louisiana Watershed Initiative. It's a similar approach where they've identified their Huck 8s. They've used state dollars to um, create the materials and the, um, the planning documents so that those Hucks can actually go and do the, the prioritization to meet their local needs. And they've held back $150 million to fund into those watersheds for the priority projects. What I think is important to think about is these are really critical processes because we can't sit here in Raleigh and make decisions for what's needed in the landscape, but we also need a mechanism so that there's support there. I'll quickly tell you a story about a, a conversation we were having in Goldsboro just before the pandemic hit. EDF had worked with, with Barbara and Jack and NC State to put together some models of Stony Creek. And we had taken that to the city and said, hey, let's go apply for one of these federal grants, the, FEMA brick program and try to get some federal dollars in here to Stony Creek to reduce flooding at your hospital. We had some conversations, people were really excited, but finally one of the officials said, I just don't have the staff capacity to write the application for the federal grant, right? This is something we hear around the state. And so how do we create these federal dollars in a way, or how do we create these processes that can get the capacity on the ground so when we go back and look at what are all of these different watershed approaches that we've looked at around the country, um, Louisiana, Iowa, Minnesota, elsewhere, they kind of do three things. And I'll just kind of put these out. One is they empower local catalysts, right? They get money to hire watershed coordinators. Um, they're getting people on the ground to have those conversations at a local level. They're providing funding for those priority projects. We all know of planning processes where people come together, they put their sweat equity in, they come up with an idea, 
They say, how are we gonna make this happen? And there's no money. Holding money back to actually do planning, to do the projects that the planning process results in creates that impetus to actually do the work. And then this idea of shared action is something that we've been exploring a lot more in the literature around communities of practice, which is when people start to do the work together, when they design the projects, they put them in the ground, they see them happening, it reinforces that shared action, reinforces new ways of thinking, which reinforces the watershed approaches and builds that political support. So this is one place that we've been thinking a lot about. It's a critical piece of our policy framework. So the next one that I wanna talk about for a minute is the uh, is decision support tools. North Carolina has some of the nation's best data sets and models and mapping. We've got Feynman, right, to show where vulnerability and risk are. Um, we've got places like Charlotte that have got great models and dashboards to help inform what kinds of projects should be funded. Um, but none of the data that we have is readily available and actionable at this point across the state to our communities. So how do we take you know, the different graphs and, and models that we've been seeing today and turn it into projects on the ground? Well, we're really excited that one of the um, advances that's been made in the last budget cycle is the state legislature has allocated $20 million to the flood resilience blueprint. You may have heard about this. Uh, Division of Mitigation Services within DEQ is the implementing agency. They've recently requested comments. They're putting together um, scopes of work to hire a vendor team to go out and develop this decision support team, support tool, this blueprint that will help translate the models into data that's actionable for communities. This is hopefully gonna get started in the summer and will uh, has a deadline by the legislature of uh, December of 2023. We'll see if they can make that, maybe pushing a little bit, but this is gonna be um, take North Carolina's national leadership in data and translate it into actionable information for communities. The third piece of this framework is state coordination. I want, to, I want to kind of get you to think for a second, like who, if you think about our state government, who deals with flooding? Who's responsible, right? You're probably jumping to mind emergency management, DOT, we've got NCOR, DEQ, our universities do a lot of research, right? Almost everyone in state government is dealing with flooding in some way, but who's in charge? Right, like, who's, who's our point person? Who do you go to? Who's, who's making sure that all these agencies are moving in the same direction, right? We do have a um, chief resilience office, which is charged with doing some of this. They're great people there. They are doing their best, but they're understaffed and not quite given the political support they need. So right now, it seems like there's no one kind of in charge of making sure that we're all heading in the same direction with the state. Why does this matter? Well, the state needs to have consistent metrics, right? Consistent approaches, um, consistent ways of getting this money out the door. And in a minute, you're gonna see how many different ways money is flowing out the door in the state. So how do we kind of coordinate in a way, how do we create this central um, entity to go be in charge of flooding, um, to move us forward and to interact both with the federal agencies and our local governments? This is something that other states have done. Um, South Carolina, Virginia, Florida have all recently passed legislation putting a chief resilience officer in the governor's office at kind of a high political level to then manage all of the other agencies. Um, Louisiana has a longstanding um, process to do this as well. So we're looking at ways that we can improve the state coordination going forward. Then the fourth piece, the funding and financing. Right? There's an unprecedented amount of money flowing into North Carolina, um, both from our current state budget, as well as from the federal infrastructure um, bill. In response to the flooding that's been happening in the state, um, Matthew and Florence, but more recently Dorian and Fred, 
all of the smaller unnamed um, storms that are causing localized flooding, the state authorized $800 million in flood mitigation, and they actually appropriated about 400 million, which means there's 400 million sitting in reserves for future use. And of that 400 million, about 300 million is for pre-disaster um, efforts. And I wanna just kind of touch on a couple of those pieces um, here real quick. So we've talked about natural infrastructure today. There's two new funding um, pots within existing entities, the Land and Water Fund um, within Department of Cultural and Natural Resources and the Division of Mitigation Services within DEQ. Thinking about how the science flows through to connect with this natural infrastructure, I wanna just focus for a second on the Division of Mitigation Services program. This is a program that uh, uses their um, contracting mechanisms with private, into, private firms to go out and engage with landowners to develop projects. Where the science comes in is they need to know how much flood reduction to actually ask for in those watersheds. And so this pilot is gonna be in Stony Creek. We've got some of that modeling that's been done by NC State and is available to Division Mitigation Services to move that process forward. We're excited that the blueprint, when it's completed, will provide that kind of information across the watersheds of the state. You'll see other money here for local capacity and project support. Um, this is important as well to begin to get these projects on the ground um, going forward. The other big pot of money that people are talking about these days is the natural, or sorry, the federal infrastructure bill. This is, you know, literally billions and billions of dollars. I wanna put, focus your attention on a couple. One is the amount of money coming into the clean water state revolving funds, as well as a brand new program called the STORM Act, which is a FEMA program, also a state revolving fund. The way these programs, these state revolving funds work is a local entity can develop a project and essentially get a loan from the state to put that practice on the ground and then use a revenue stream available to the local government to repay the project over a 20 to 30 year time period. Natural infrastructure has been hard to put these projects together because we haven't had good information on the quantified and economic benefits of those projects. And so it's research like it's being presented today that's going on at other locations that's gonna help us to make this case to take some of this $11 billion, that's a federal number, not a state number. But North Carolina's gonna be getting hundreds of millions of dollars flowing in for these types of projects. So we're excited to be part of this moving forward. So I wanna just wrap up with just a couple of, of quick thoughts. One, to say, you know, how these programs hit the, hit the ground in the next months and years um, is going to be important both for the potential to reduce flooding, but also we're hoping to really use the information that's coming out of conferences like this to make the case that that infrastructure goes into safe areas, right? That we're not putting it into vulnerable and risky locations. But climate change, right, is here to stay. Unfortunately, the impacts are becoming um, ever clearer with every storm. And so this framework that we're talking about that we're pushing um, is not something that we're gonna get exactly right this year, next year, but over the coming years, getting a framework like this in place will allow us to take the science, to prioritize projects, to get natural infrastructure into watersheds. And as I'm, as I'm talking here to, to those of you who are researchers, I'm sure that your research is kind of like your baby, right? It, you release it out. We're excited to create this policy framework so that your research can be used to better uh, target where on the landscape we put our projects and make those as effective as possible. So thanks so much. I'm happy to be part of this process and look forward to any questions from me or the whole crew. All right, any questions for Will or any of the other panelists? Well, thank you for attending the session. And again, if you want the full report, 
Uh, you want to do some heavy reading <laughs> at bedtime for a put yourself to sleep. I've got that for you. 